Hello everyone and welcome to this Blender tutorial where we're going to see how to easily create various planets like those ones thanks to procedural generation. The core idea will be to overlap three spheres, one for the planet, one for the clouds and one for the atmosphere, and then use Blender's node-based system for shaders to make some unique and customizable materials. In this video, we'll be working with the Cycles Render Engine, so don't forget to check in your scene settings in the Render Properties panel that you are indeed using Cycles. I will also use a built-in add-on called the Node Wrangler that is really handy whenever you work with shader graphs, so feel free to check that you too have it enabled in your user preferences. Okay, to begin with, let's remove the Startup Cube and instead press Shift A to add an icosphere. To make it a bit smoother, we can add a few subdivisions, something like 5 or 6, and then change the shading mode of our object to the smooth shade. This first sphere will be our planet. We can then duplicate it once for cloud and another time for our atmosphere and hide both those new objects for now since we'll focus on the planet first. Let's now move the camera to have it face the sphere and close enough for the object to be almost in full frame, except for a little offset for the atmosphere effect. I'll also replace my light by another of type Sun and rotate it diagonally. If we go to the random mode, we see that this gives us a basic lighting setup from the top right. We can also rotate our light slightly along the x-axis to better highlight the curvature of the planet and then most importantly, readjust the intensity of our light. With all that done, our scene is now ready and it's time to move on to shaders. First, I'm going to add a new window in my layout over here and pick the shader editor. Then on the left side, I'll stay in the camera view, but remove all the menus and handles to get a real-time visualization of my result. We can now click on the new button at the top of the screen to add the material to our planet object and we see that Blender automatically creates two nodes. The output node that assigns the result of the entire shader graph to the material and just before the principled PSDF node that is the default shader type and that allows us to do a whole bunch of interesting effects for the color, the glossiness, the emissivity or the transparency of our object. The idea behind a planet shader will be to use mathematical noises to generate areas with a pseudo-random grayscale and then translate this data into various properties, either the color, the glossiness or even some bump effects. So first of all, let's create a noise texture node. If we press Ctrl and Shift and then click on the node, then thanks to the Node Wrangler add-on, we get a preview of the output of this node on our object. What we see here is that the node creates a basic noise with random gray values. The problem is that we can't see it clearly because everything is quite light. To fix this, we can use a color ramp. This node allows us to easily remap the input colors into other colors. For example, here we can bring back the left cursor to the right to remap the middle values to lower tints, which therefore increases the contrast of our nose and in turn makes it easier to see the result. We can already spot a few areas that could look like some lands and oceans, but we're not there yet. In particular, we don't have enough details and jagged edges to really get a feel of a planet surface. The trick is actually to chain two noises one after the other, and then play around with their parameters. Typically, if we increase the scale, we get more of those little zones. If we change the values of detail and roughness, we gradually get something that looks more like the expected planet's ground effect that we want. Here are a few examples of values that give quite a good result, but of course you should feel free to tweak and test to better understand how each value impacts the final visual. Note that adding distortion can increase some swirls here and there, but for now we'll keep things simple and keep it to zero on both noises. Okay, at this point we have various grayscales that are pretty close to oceans and continents, with the oceans in the dark parts and the land everywhere else. The next step is therefore to use this data to create a color map, a glossy and matte area map, and some bump effects to simulate altitude. So the point is to consider this initial black and white map as a height map of sorts, where black is for the lowest altitudes and white is for the highest peaks. Let's start with the glossiness. What we want here is for our oceans, meaning the dark areas, to be fairly glossy, while the lens should be matte. 
To do this, we're going to change our roughness property based on the generated grayscale map. First of all, we should do a Ctrl Shift click on our principal BSDF to re-enable it in the preview render, and I'll also use the black and white map for my color to help me visualize my effect for now. Now we see that when we push the roughness towards zero, the planet becomes very glossy. Whereas when we push it to one, the surface becomes very matte. In other words, we're going to need to have a dark grey for ocean's roughness so that they're rather glossy and a very light grey for the rest of the planet so that the lands are mostly matte. We could simply use the procedurally generated grayscale map as is by putting the output of our color ramp into the roughness slot of the principal BSDF but since our oceans are basically black in this data map, the surface is way too glossy in these places. In reality, at this distance of a planet, we wouldn't be able to see all the reflections in the water and it would be a bit more rough. To solve this issue, we can use another color ramp. This time, we want to convert our low colors, i.e. the ones close to black, to a dark gray that is slightly less extreme, and we can also bring back the high values to a light grey instead of a pure white to have just a hint of reflectivity on the continents. By sliding the second marker to the left, we can also control how the glossiness should be related to the altitude. The closer the markers, the more limited the shiny areas, because they'll correspond to a very small range of grey values. Then, to transform this grayscale map into colors, the technique is actually exactly the same. We are once again going to use a color ramp to transform our data. Except this time, rather than outputting all the grays to remap, we'll associate our initial grayscale to real colors. So again, the color ramp is here to make it easy to define a property for our planet, here the color of its surface, based on its altitude, as given by our procedurally generated black and white height map. For example, if we click on the plus or do a control click on the color ramp, we can add new markers and specify a particular color for this exact altitude. Blender then interpolates between those values for the rest with gradients. Note that you can change the behavior of these gradients by switching up the interpolation type. Typically, if you want to visualize your different levels, you can use the constant mode and completely remove any interpolation. Or else you can just test the values to find what's the best for you. Finally, we're going to use our grayscale data one last time for a third property, the normals. The point here is to generate a bump thanks to our initial heights. To do this, we just have to use a bump node, bring the output of our first color ramp in its height slot, and then put its output in the normal property of our BSDF. Usually, the effect is too strong by default for our case, so we should lower the strength value of the bump node to get something more discrete. And here we are. With all of this, we now have finished our first material, the most complex one, the one for the surface of our planet. Next up are the clouds. Before anything else, let's re-enable the object and scale it up slightly so it is just larger than the planet. The idea here is to make this object semi-transparent to have cloud masses in various spots above the surface, while still showing the planet itself underneath in most places. And in truth, it will mostly be about reusing what we just saw in an easier example. Like before, we'll add a noise texture node and a color ramp to remap our colors. Then, instead of using this grayscale for the color or the glossiness of our object, we'll use it for its transparency, or in other words, the alpha property of our object. This already makes for quite a nice cloudy effect, but to improve the results further, we can change the parameters of our noise texture a bit. For example, we can keep a fairly small size but have some fun with the distortion to create some turbulence effect, and feel free to also move the color ramp markers to better integrate the clouds with the planet. Okay, we've now got our planet with some nice clouds over it, all of this generated procedurally from a few noise textures. For the final touch, we're going to add an atmosphere effect around the planet to get this light aura you saw in my intro examples. So first, we'll re-enable the atmosphere object and scale it up so that it encapsulates the two other ones. Then we'll make a new material for our atmosphere, and this shader will be a bit different from the others. For this one, instead of using the surface output, we'll use the volume one, to create a shading of the inner volume of the object rather than its surface. 
This is what will make this foggy result all around the planet. In this volume slot, we can put the output of a volume scatter node, and we can change its color to something like a light blue. The atmosphere already has a circular shape, but to better control its aspect, we're going to use a gradient texture noise in spherical mode. To define where the center of this gradient is, we'll get back the position of our object thanks to texture coordinate and mapping nodes. Then, as usual, we use a color ramp to have more control on the output of our gradient and better adapt the fade-out effect to the size of our planet. This value will be used for the density of our volume scatter. And by default, this value between 0 and 1 is a bit low. So it's a good idea to add a math node after it, switch it to multiply node and multiply our value by a small factor like 3 or so. If the atmosphere doesn't show up, don't hesitate to scale up the object around the planet and the clouds, and play around with the color ramp to improve the fade-out effect. With this last layer, our procedural planet render is now done, and we have an easy-to-tweak workflow to create dozens of variations just by changing a few parameters here and there. To make a nice render of our scene, we need to go to the render parameters and turn our film transparent so that the planet is rendered without any background, then head up to the Compositing tab at the top, enable the compositing using nodes, and add a node of type alpha over between the render image input and the final output. Here we want the first slot to be black to make the background black, and then our planet render to be pasted on top. And there you go, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and that you learned a few things to create your own planets in a procedural way. Don't hesitate to like it if you did, and to subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, if you have other ideas of cool blender tricks that you'd like to learn, tell me in the comments. As usual, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.